With that, I think we're ready to announce the next segment of the opening. We would like to call to the stage to introduce the next segment of the opening, our good friend and uh, longtime World Scars Cup team member, Patrick McDonald, the third. Scholar, let's make some noise for Patrick. Thanks, guys. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the round, Alex Dang. Alex is the creator of the poem, What Kind of Asian Are You? He was born and raised in Portland, Oregon in the United States, and he started performing poetry at the age of 17. He hasn't slowed down since. He was on the Portland Poetry Slam Nationals team for four years straight from 2013 through 2016, and he earned his way to becoming the Eugene Portland Grand Slam champion in 2014, 2015, and again in 2017. He has been a TEDx speaker, and his work has been featured on Huffington Post, Upworthy, and Everyday Feminism. His YouTube videos have been viewed over two million times. He is our keynote speaker, not just for here in The Hague, but at five of our six global rounds. And we are profoundly honored to welcome him to our community. Please join me in giving Alex a warm World Scholars Cup welcome. Howdy, y'all. My name is Alex Dang. I'm a writer and poet from Portland, Oregon, United States of America. And if it's all right with you, I'd like to perform some poetry for y'all. Thank you. Um, when I was reading about a world on the margins, I really considered what that means. What that means as far as narratives go, what that means as far as history goes, the haves, the have-nots, and when I think about a world on the margins, I think about how I think about how a lot of us have a level of marginalization to us. There's always something that makes us different. But when we take that thing that makes us different, when we decide that no longer we should be on the margin, but we centralize our own narrative, when we make our own story the center and make it the world, a world on the margins becomes our world itself. So in this keynote, I'd like to kind of lay out the idea of centralizing, normalizing, making your story, however marginalized it is, into your center, into your world. I've done this a lot with poetry, and I really enjoy poetry and love poetry because poetry doesn't care about who you are. Poetry merely cares. And the best way to get someone to care about something that you like is to actually write about something you care about. And I argue that you should care about yourself and that I argue that you are probably the most interesting thing about yourself. And it's all about being able to tell your story. And I was able to tell my story through poetry and every time I tell this story, I always have to start from the beginning and that usually starts with my parents. But before that, I need to actually ask you guys first, how many of y'all know what actually Poetry Slam is? Like on a scale of like, I know what slam poetry is. I kind of know what slam poetry is. Alex, I have no idea what slam poetry is. Uh, who is High Flyers? We got a writer over here too. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Oops, I shouldn't swear. Um, who's Wobbly Hands? All right, we got a lot of wobbly hands, that's fine, that's cool. Uh, who's Shrug Emoji? Who's like Alex? I have no idea what's going on. Same, I've never been to a poetry slam either, but it's okay because it's all made up. Let me tell you the story. In the 1980s, a horrible construction worker named Mark Smith invented poetry slam, but we don't care about Mark Smith. We actually don't really like Mark Smith, even though he technically invented poetry slam. So when we hear his name, we all yell, so what? So, uh, once again, it was invented in the 1980s by a horrible man named Mark Smith. So what? 
exactly. We don't care about Mark Smith. He sucks. Who we do care about is Patricia Smith, Susie Q, and Ma uh, Mahogany Brown, three black femme poets who brought Poetry Slam to the genre of what we know of it today. Basically, they wanted to bring poetry back into the audience, and that means y'all can react if you hear something you like. Just like in a debate, just like in a speech, if you hear something you agree with, you can snap. Can y'all try snapping with me? Um, if it's kind of a little more uh, deeper and you don't want to make a lot of noise, you can just, you know, rub your hands. Nice, nice. Uh, you can audibly tell me. You can, you, can groan, you can moan, you can groan, you can say yes, you can go uh, you can go what, you can go yes, poet. You can audibly tell me if I'm doing a good job. And of course, yeah, you can boo if you'd like. If I'm not doing a good job, y'all should let me know so then I can keep continuing to try to do a better job. So if I were to say something like, Carly Rae Jepsen is the greatest of all time. Ooh, we got some CRJ haters. I do not like any of y'all now. Uh, but what if I said something about like, I read in, I think it was Newsweek, that they were, uh, doing a re they were doing a study and analysis on the newest generation, like us new folks. And they were saying that the newest generation of people are going to be the most selfish, entitled, and narcissistic of all the generations ever. <laughs> Oh, oh, we like that resolution, we like that motion. And my whole response to that, I was like thinking about it, and I just kind of was like, well, so what? The world can bow down to all the dope things that we do. This is gonna be a uh, hashtag no filter. This is gonna be GPOY. This is gonna be every selfie Sunday, transformation Tuesday, and forget you Friday, we've been too busy to address. Are we selfish? Because we are too concerned with carving a spot for us in history. Too busy burning the candle at every end due to our insatiable blaze for more. This fire we cradle like Prometheus did, a gift for the rest of mankind. Funny how being selfish looks so much like survival. Looks like extracurriculars, part-time jobs, and college graduations planned like a perfect wedding. Look like the fish in the barrel shooting back. Look like loans that Atlas couldn't shoulder. Look like all-nighters because we cannot afford sleep. We are entitled. We expected a home to move into and instead got our house buckling in the floodwaters. We are beginning to repair every problem left behind for us, including the kitchen sink. We, fixers of the previous tenant because the land Lord hasn't done anything in years. Of course we feel entitled. Look at what the generations did before us. We still consider the fist of Mike Tyson knocking down giants, feeling the rattle Nirvana crooned and are warmed by a threes company's home. Look, we learn from the best. Why settle when you can grow cities and monuments out of the old? They taught us that, told us to connect with the world, and now we do it faster at 120 megabits per second. The selfie-obsessed generation. What, like it's bad that we want to remember the rest of our lives? That deep inside this unrelenting precariousness of, 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 of tomorrow, we still want to look back on today, on yesterday, and think, God damn, look at how far we have all gotten. We are not narcissistic. We just like looking at ourselves. <laughs> and our friends and their every day because we've made every part of life extraordinary to capture. So yes, we are gonna Instagram a meal and yeah, we're gonna live tweet a conversation or two. Everybody does it. My president has a stupid Twitter account. We are all members of this dubstep choir, right? Remixes exist because there are some songs that are so good, they need to be played again and again and again. Are there memories of all nighters gonna be different from ours? Caffeine has not not really changed. Is there Monopoly so much better than Smash Bros. Melee? Let's be real, both destroys friendships. Nothing will be the same after this stupid game. All I'm trying to say is that the revolution has never, ever, ever been televised, and yet it has always found a way to be heard. This time it's being told through our voice. Sit down, listen to us, take a few notes. So that's kind of what a poem looks like. Y'all want me to do some more? Yeah. All right, so now I get to start at the beginning of my story, which, which starts with my parents, because they kind of uh, made me or whatever. But um, So my mom and dad are 
pretty cool. I like them a lot, but um, they're very different people and very good people, and we argue a lot, we fight a lot, but we hug it out, we love each other. Uh, man, there were some years when we just could not stand each other, but uh, we're better now. And as I look back on my life, starting from the beginning, I always think about my parents because my mom and dad are immigrants to the United States of America. They escaped Vietnam after the destruction and the collapse of the country during the war around the late 70s. Now, my mom tells this escape story every year. Ever since I was little, she told me this story. And it takes, like, no joke, eight hours to tell-ish, because that many things happened to her. And it was a lot of very, very horrible, tragic things, but yet she tells us this story every year. She reminds us every year because she doesn't want us to forget where we came from, but also she never wants to forget where she came from. And I think that's incredible, but she will always say that her story is not what made her super, right? Just like how everybody here has a superpower, but your origin story did not make you a superhero. Right, like the people that I look up to do not tell me that their Uncle Ben, destruction of Krypton, night at the opera is what made them strong. The people that I look up to do not tell me that their drug addiction or alcoholism or grief is what made them strong. The people that I look up to do not tell me that the worst thing that ever happened to them is what made them good. Let me explain. I was born, bore witness, to her immense strength. As far as superheroes go, my mom is the most overpowered. With a frame of four foot 10 inches, my mother, about yay high, Noctu Tran, redefines comic book badassery. Super strength. With one hand, she carried four sons, tossed their sorry selves through college, and with the other, made my father a mountain of a man, a pebble smooth into the shape of her palm. Intelligence, such gems like do it right once or do it wrong three times, don't be sorry, just don't do it again. And of course, the world's favorite, of course I know everything, Alex. I'm your mom. Telepathy, all the times that I thought I was being sneaky in high school, but she was just letting me get away with it. Clairvoyance, she can see ghosts too. She can still see her father, like when she was seven, still hanging in the kitchen after he found out the government was going to take him away. Still drifting in her mind back and forth a pendulum ticking away her innocence. She hears ghosts too. She still hears the cries of my sister, still feels her small form, all bundle of light, all star glow, gone as soon as she's shown in this world. Resilience, all she could do was watch. Watch her mother's wedding ring spirit away into the captain's pocket, jingling with all the other boat people's tickets out of the only home that they have ever known. Watch countries deny refugees of safety, of humanity, of existence. Watch days crawl in a re-education camp where she learned nothing but adversity, immortality. She should have died become a statistic about Vietnamese immigrants who did not make it, a prisoner of Viet Cong, and another shouting point for American protesters to end a war that she simply called childhood, and yet she stands, still stands as a lesson to prove how incredible we all can be. She has never let her tragedy trump her triumph, never accepted that this was all there was, never waited for a miracle to grant a miracle that I call mom. She only stitched up my cape and told me, fly. Once I did that poem at a, uh, at, a, at, a, at a competition, and it was the last poem of the night. I performed it, it clinched my win, it got the highest score of the night. I was so excited, I called my mom. I was like, mom, 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 I did your poem and I won. And she was like, you're welcome. <laughs> and I was like, sheesh. I mean, she's my momager, like she gets 10% of everything, so what else? <laughs> now my dad, on the other hand, uh, his escape story is one sentence long. I snuck onto a fishing boat, and then he like walks off. And I'm like, wait, what? What else? Like mom's takes eight hours to tell, and you just say, I snuck onto a fishing, and then what? Like my uncle's literally is, I stole a helicopter. And then I'm like, and then what? Did you like drive it to America? Like how does that work? Like that's all you're gonna give me? And I know so many people like my mom, like my aunts, like my uncles, who knows every detail of their story and they will immediately tell you because it's that important to them. And then there are folks like my dad and my other uncle and my other aunts who either essentialize it to one sentence or they just tell you to do something else and then you forget about it. And when I was younger, I always wondered 
why my dad was so hesitant about telling me his story. But as I got older, I realized he was always telling me his story. He was just focused on something else. While my mom tells me to remember where I come from, my dad's always telling me to look where I'm going. He was always obsessed with a today and a tomorrow and a tomorrow and a tomorrow that he didn't really care about yesterday or the past. He was just focused on the future. So as I learned that maybe that's his story, maybe that's what he's giving to me, I started to really, really try to understand his story and try to listen to him. It turns out my uncle who stole that helicopter actually is in textbooks. Like, I only found out he was one of those dudes who landed the helicopter on, a, on the aircraft carriers because I saw his name in a museum. And I was like, hey, uncle, how come you never told us this? And he was like, oh, I don't know. Didn't really come up. But you know what he always talks about? My cousin Eugene, who is a doctor, he is so proud of his son, and yet he's never talked about how he's literally in history books. And I think that's so incredible because that's his story. That's what he wants to tell. So as I think about my dad and I think about his story, um, I think about how he's been a mechanic my entire life. And once when I was in eighth grade, I asked him, like, why does he like cars so much? And he thought about it, and he said, well, um, when I got to this country, I saw all of these magnificent metal beasts roam the streets, eat stronger, more glitter than the last. He told me, son, America? loves cars, like really loves cars. Like I saw more cars than I've ever seen in my entire life and I immediately thought, damn, someone has to be there to fix all of those cars, to fix all of those problems. So even back then, my dad was thinking about job security. <laughs> my dad and I, we don't talk very much. We say a total of like 13 words when we drive home and then we let the hum of the pavement fill in the rest. My dad likes cars because they are easier than people, right? Because people don't have a dashboard, don't have a check engine light, don't tell you if something is wrong. But cars, cars are always honest. My dad, always honest. He doesn't talk much, but he lets his motor oil hands speak for him. Growing up, my brothers and I never learned much about cars. Four sons of a mechanic, not one of us could replace a tire. <laughs> My dad just never taught us. He said he would be around forever to fix all of our cars. Plus, we'd be college men. We'd be doing more important things with our hands. My dad never talks about love, but he always shows it. So while he teaches me how to drive, he tells me to listen to the car. Cars always tell you what is wrong, but only if you listen, Alex. So I'm trying to listen to the car on some weird Mr. Miyagi test, and my dad says, hey, stop making jokes and listen. And I go, okay, I'll try to listen. And I'm now really, really trying to listen to the car, and I hear the whir of the engine and the pistons pumping fire and gasoline as we cruise down Powell. Then I imagine the power it must take to get metal son and father down the boulevard. And then I hear my dad's heart. I hear this heavy, ancient machinery, all ignition and patience as I go too fast in a school zone, or I get to turn my blinkers on, and my dad laughs and tells me to check my mirrors, check my blind spots, check my weaknesses, tells me to listen. My dad has been listening his entire life, never once turned on the emergency brake, kept sugar out of his gas tank, turned a key, carried an entire family with him, but his heart is getting weaker. Nothing lasts forever. Some things you can only prevent from breaking down further, so I try to find the owner's manual to my father, try to reassemble the engine of his childhood to see what steered him here, but his make is of another generation, something I can't understand, something his dashboard refuses to show me, something I don't have instructions to. There's so much mileage in my father's bones. Stops in the road, never mentioned because he told us dead end, wrong way, turn around. I don't know what he is hiding in his workshop what corroded secrets he harbors like rusted ghosts in a junkyard. All I know is I want my hands to look like they've been dipped in oil, to look like they've done something important, like a mechanic, like my dad. I want to be like my dad, y'all. Someone who always carries you from the back seat into your front bed, and who, always lets you sit on, who always lets you sit on the front lap and steer the wheel, who always reminds you to buckle your seatbelt. Dad, I know you won't ever tell me what is wrong, but it's okay. We'll just drive instead. I promise. I'm listening. Thank you. So
So that's where I come from. You know, my mom's Chinese, grew up in Vietnam, escaped Vietnam. My dad's Vietnamese, escaped Vietnam, grew up in Vietnam, escaped. They met in Virginia in Falls Church. Uh, they had my two oldest brothers there, and then they moved out to Oregon for work, had my third oldest brother there, and then had me eventually. Bless my mother's heart for having a house full of boys, but like, we're really dumb, so I'm sure she didn't really have her hands full or anything. I'm sure she thought it was a cakewalk. <laughs> but, um, me growing up, I was a really lonely kid. I was a very confused kid, still am, still very confused, still very sad. I always cry all the time, but um, you know, cause crying is good. It actually like is good to get those emotions out. There's literal like chemicals and tears that actually make you feel better once you cry. Like you have to cry out these emotions. Actually, crying is the best thing ever. Anyways, I used to cry a lot and I didn't know why I would cry back in the day. And I think now it's a lot of it was just a really, really, really abrupt confusion about who I was. Because I knew I was Alex Dang, I knew I was Noc Tran's son, I knew I was Hip Dang's son, I knew that I was the little brother of Richard, Eric, and John, but sometimes when I went out into the world, people questioned my identity. I remember in preschool, everyone thought I was dumb because I didn't know the word apple. And I was like crying in the middle of class, and I was like, but I do know the word for it, because I knew it in Chinese and Vietnamese, but I didn't know it in English. And I felt so dumb, but I knew it in other languages. Why wasn't I smart because of that? And then I remember this other time when I was lost in a grocery store, an Asian grocery store, and no one could understand me because I was speaking like Cantonese and Mandarin and Vietnamese all at once. I was speaking this really, really weird like patois and like only my parents and my family could understand me, but no one else could. So then my parents made the decision of like, okay, we only have to speak Vietnamese at home and we're gonna speak English everywhere else. And they had to make that decision right then and there to be like, you're an American here, you're Vietnamese here. You're Chinese there, you're someone else here. And I now realize that it was a really important moment in which our cultures, as much as we wanted them to be the same, had to be split apart because of the way the world treated us. So this is a poem dedicated to anyone who felt like that they had to split themselves into multiple people just because of the way they talked or the way they looked or the way they wanted to be. Because I talk a lot now, but I remember back then, I didn't even know how to speak. I remember talking a Frankenstein monster tongue of Vietnamese and English. The gaps between two broken languages cannot make a full sentence, so every other Wednesday during kindergarten, I'd be pulled out of class to fix my speech. They told me what was wrong was that my words blurred like hummingbird wings and my song came out as a whirlwind, too quick to comprehend, too fast to decipher. There are strands of line pouring out with different clicks and keys, a broken Morse code that twisted wicked confusion easy. But I learned how to smooth and comb the knots of my talk at the same time I was taught Chinese in elementary school, so no one would expect chipped china plates lined along the soft of my gums. But unfortunately, I only mastered English. At family gatherings, uncles and aunts spoke super duper slowly to me, their sentences just hanging in the air. While on the other hand, I would read letters to my parents. I translated for them. I learned how to do big speeches and jump rope rhymes like 99 nuns in an Indiana nunnery or I wish to wash my Iris wish watch. I learned how to say things my parents could never say. And in class, I studied Chinese, found out how to say the things I already knew how to say in English, but forgot to label in Vietnamese. And there's some Chinese words that sound exactly like their English definition. For example, um, Coca-Cola, Cafe, Olagan. And there's some Vietnamese words that sound ugly and jagged as they hang out of my mouth. They dangle awkward and loose from my teeth. I speak elbows and frayed vocal cords as hard as I tried to adopt my native voice back and never came out, came out as clean or as silky as the commercial talk that I heard on television every day. 
My mother is Chinese. My father is Vietnamese. I am American. She speaks Chinese. He dreams Vietnamese. I speak repaired tongue. I dream renovated dialect. I'm sorry, but can you speak a little bit slower? I'm sorry, but can you just repeat yourself? It's not that I don't want to talk to you, right? It's just because I can't. It's because I don't know how. I'm still trying to tell you. I'm still holding on so tightly to the stitched words and patched up language of my childhood. Even in my perfect English, there are some things I just don't know how to say. My mom tells me that some theme is a Vietnamese word that does not exist in English. It means I'm done. It means I am through. I am at the end of my rope. So now I'm growing older, I'm confused about what languages to speak, I'm confused about my identity, I get older in high school, and now I start liking girls, and now I start liking boys, and I start not liking myself, and I go, what is this? This is garbage, being a teenager sucks. Um, and then I find poetry. Then I find the page listening back to me. I always retreated to books. I always retreated to journaling and writing. I wanted to be a rapper when I was in middle school, so I was writing a lot of rhymes and stuff in general. Yeah, what's good, what's good, what's good? And um, eventually, I made it to poetry because it just allowed me to really, really express all what I was feeling. And unfortunately, what I was feeling in high school was isolated. I was feeling lonely. I was feeling angry. I was feeling just angsty, you know? But for once, Poetry was there to listen to me. And for once in my life, I had someone truly listening to my story, but they were saying, no, 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 Alex, I don't want any artifice. I don't want any shimmering lights. I don't want any glitter. I just want your truth. Alex, just tell me what you really, really feel. So the first real poem I ever wrote was born out of a, it was born out of something that I had in my heart and that I was always dealing with and I didn't know how to really deal with. It was something that I was vulnerable about, it was something I was scared about, but I finally wrote it down because there's a really great quote saying that my story isn't the greatest, the most beautiful, the most terrifying, it's just the one that has its hands wrapped around my throat. And I think that's really lovely because it's this idea of you have to tell your story, otherwise it's gonna choke you, right? So, today, so then one day in high school, I finally decided to write my real story, decided to write a poem that actually scared me. I was shaking on stage when I read it. And all because of the times, many times in my life that I was just mistaken for someone else. This poem was born out of, out of misidentity, out of not being seen of who I am. It was born out of all the times I've been mistaken for a girl. One. Ever since I was tall enough to reach the phone, perched and mounted against the wall, I was old enough to answer it. And every time I did answer the phone, I was always greeted by someone on the other end calling me ma'am. But for the longest time, I thought they were saying man, because I was cool and hip man, and it was in the 90s, and I grew up then, too. Uh, when entering high school, I found a correlation between girls finding I was cute and long, swishy hair. So I grew my hair out, like how optimists never cut their dreams down or how dreamers never trim their hopes short. But this lion's mane became, remained a gender mystery to some store owners asking my then girlfriend and I, so how are you ladies doing tonight? Three. Um, I was always a crier. And with three older brothers, manlier and tougher than I, it wouldn't be strange to hear, shut up or buck up. Uncomfortably familiar like loneliness, hearing stop being a girl was a terrible mantra that I just got used to. Four, though very far from uh, the truth, my mom in her traditional ways believes gay to be synonymous with effeminate. So it wouldn't be odd for her to question my sexuality due to the clothing I wore or how much time I spent on appearances. How are you, why, like, why don't you go do boy things? How are you gonna take care of your wife? Five, when my father found out that sometimes I like looking at boys, he told my mother that he lost a son, and I can't help but think about my sister who's six. My mother always complained about having four boys, no daughters. Seven, my sister was born in 1991, but eight, died three days after her birth due to complications. Nine, my mother did not want to have any children after that. But 10, my father said he had a feeling, and I don't know what that feeling was, but I think it was 11, that he wanted to have another daughter. Twelve, 
I didn't come out the way they expected. 13, I think I was a failure before I was even conceived. Three, I was always a crier. 14, I was always so mad at myself for being so sensitive. 15, why wasn't it okay to play house with the girls? 16, I was never good at cops and robbers. 17, they called roll and said Alexandria. Zero, I was a disappointment before I even began. 12, I didn't come out the way they expected. 12, I didn't come out the way they expected. 12, I didn't come out the way they expected. And now I'm at some variable of a number. Wondering if it still makes a difference. My hair is longer. My voice is a little deeper. I have a mustache now and facial hair. Mom, dad, world, don't you understand that I don't do things a boy does. I don't do things a girl does. I do things that a person does. I do things that I want to do. That poem means a lot to me because um, I was really, 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 really vulnerable when I read that. And a lot of people came up to me and said, hey, Alex, thank you for your truth. Hey, Alex, thank you for sharing your story. And I didn't think that something so specific could relate to so many people. And um, it was a very important poem to me. But unfortunately, the first time my parents saw that poem was on YouTube. <laughs> and then they called me <laughs> and they were like, Yo, how come you never told us? We would have listened, we would have understood, and I went, oh damn, I guess I never really did have that conversation with y'all, huh? Oops. And it was a big learning moment for me because as much as that version of Alex knew that that was his truth, right? That he was angry, that he was sad, that he just wanted to be seen. I can see now that if I had the foresight to talk to my parents, to talk to my brothers, to talk to anybody more about it, that poem, would have changed and probably become a better poem. Uh, there's a poem I have that uh, started off as me trying to tell my mom why she doesn't understand my depression. But then before I did that, I, tried to, I was like, I should probably talk to her first before I write this poem. I don't want to repeat myself again. <laughs> and I had a conversation with her, and she was talking me to, uh, uh, to me about her depression and about her, uh, deal, about her stress and the way that she deals with things. And all of a sudden, the poem in which I was going to tell my mom she doesn't understand me, the poem is now a poem about her telling me about sadness about how we are actually the same. And it comes from her voice because I was actually listening to her. And uh, it's one of my favorite poems. Uh, I can't perform it because I always cry when I do it and I want to cry right now, but uh, I got other poems for y'all, don't worry. Uh, but it was a really important moment for me to remember that I should be coming back to listen and I should be understanding that everybody has a story and when they tell me their story, I need to respect that, just like how while I'm telling this story, y'all are still listening to me, and I really, really love that, and I really, really appreciate that, and that level of respect goes both ways, and I didn't, I didn't extend that to my parents, and I didn't extend that to the people that I loved until very recently, and that's a lesson that I really, really wanted to hit upon, because this idea of a world on the margins, once again, if we just centralize that world, it becomes an entirely new thing. Um, once... After I graduated college, I went back home to clean out my childhood bedroom, and um, I found my Game Boy Color. So then I stopped cleaning my room, and I kept playing Pokemon, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, this is great. And I was feeling very nostalgic, right, because I was surrounded by, like, all my childhood memories. I was playing, game, I was playing Pokemon Yellow. I was thinking about my brothers and my mom and my dad and the, ba the way that I was raised and the, uh, the way that my childhood was. And then I was playing, and I got really weird, and I kept thinking to myself, huh, how come Ash doesn't have a dad? And I got really weird about it. I kept thinking, how come Ash doesn't have a dad? And then I was like, oh God, what if Ash does have a dad and his dad is like a deadbeat dad and abandoned him and then he became the greatest Pokemon trainer of all time? Like what if I become a dad and I become a deadbeat dad and I abandon my son and he becomes the greatest Pokemon trainer of all time? And I got really, really existentially crisis about this, right? I got really, really scared. I'm surrounded by all these childhood memories. I've just graduated college. I'm like, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what to do with anything. Now I'm thinking about my dad as a more complex human being. I'm like, oh my God, this is so weird. This is so weird, I can't do this. So then I try to write a poem and I do and it's called Letters to My Father by Ash Ketchum. <clears throat> Dear Dad, I left home today to become the very best. Is that why you're still out there? 
Dear dad, my metapod evolved. He started off so small, but today he sprouted rainbows from his back and protected me from danger. One day, I'll show you how strong I've gotten. Dear dad, mom doesn't talk about you much, but I think it's cause you're so cool and great and awesome that she doesn't want me to get nervous or jealous or anything. I just don't get why she hides your photos. Dear dad, I haven't been home in months and I'm starting to miss it. How do you stay away for so long? Dear Dad, I lost to someone so strong, but today I came back and I won. I did it. I didn't run away. So why did you? Dear Dad, I just left Lavender Town and everything was soaked in, in death and ghost and purple. Is that your favorite color? I think I saw you there. Dear Dad, there's this girl that I like, but I'm not sure if I like like her, right? So um, when did you know you liked Mom? Dear Dad, Mom called me today and asked when I was coming home, and I told her I didn't know. Did you have the same conversation? Dear Dad, my friend said that I cry in my sleep, which is silly. I don't have sad dreams. I just dream about Mom and me and you. Dear Dad, we're playing a game. We're trying to match moves to our personality. Misty is surf. She takes us places no one else could. Brock, strength. Never lets an obstacle stand in our way. They said I was flash because I'm always the light at the end of the tunnel. What would you be? Probably cut or fly. Dear Dad, I came home today and remembered why I wanted to leave. Dear Dad, I came home today and I never wanted to leave. Dear Dad, I love you. Dear Dad, I don't care if you're not the very best. You should just come home. Dear Dad, every day I try harder and harder and harder to answer all of these unknowns that you left behind for me. Bet you didn't see that one coming, huh? Pokemon feelings, right? Ooh. What's your favorite Pokemon? Uh, favorite Pokemon currently is Kabutops, but man, Yamper is so cute. It's, a, it's an electric corgi. He's so cute, and he got a heart butt. Oh my gosh. Um, I really like that poem, and um, because I really like Pokemon and stuff. But uh, I, I think that poem is. Let me ask y'all a question. Who here knows what happiness feels like? Who here knows what sadness feels like? Okay, who here knows what the color red looks like? Cool. Who here associates the color red with anger? Who here associates the color red with love? So just like how we can see the color red, something very simple and misinterpreted as two different things, we can always, always, always imagine what we're really talking about. So even though I'm talking about Pokemon, I treat the poem as a vehicle, and this vehicle is taking you to this place of anxiety, of fear, of responsibility. It reminds you of the place where I was coming from when I first wrote this about like being surrounded by all these childhood memories, right? Just because a poem is about one thing doesn't mean it's about that thing. I treat art as a vehicle, as something that makes you arrive at a giant feeling. So if you're writing about happiness, think about the ways that different art different conversations let you arrive at happiness. And just like how my happiness is gonna look different from your happiness, just like how we might misinterpret the color red, it's still happiness, it's still the color red. And that's why we need to have these conversations, that's why we need to take the world on the margins and centralize it to really normalize and to really, really understand everybody's narratives. Um, so, just like how I can have Pokemon feelings, y'all can probably have, I don't know, I mean, I bet you don't like biased judges. I'm sure there's some BTS fans out here. I have a lot of Brockhampton poems. I've done poems about Dungeons and Dragons. There's a poem about my brother just teaching me how to play basketball. But all these poems are vehicles to make you arrive at a larger feeling, right? Happiness, gratitude, appreciation, anger. So as I continue to do some more poems, I really, really appreciate all of y'all kind of taking this road trip with me and hopping in into all these vehicles and going to all these different places. So thank you. <laughs> But uh, sometimes you have to go somewhere that you don't really want to go, but it's necessary. You know, a place like anger, or a place like frustration, or a place like I gotta deal with some problems. And it's okay to go there, because oftentimes the journey there might reveal some happinesses, some new memories, some fun times. Uh, a poem, and a piece of art, everything can be everything. There is always room for everything and everyone. So even a poem about anger can still have some funny moments in it. Even a poem about sadness can still have happiness in it. Um, 
Even a poem about pure, pure anger can still be a poem about reclamation and re-identifying yourself. Uh, there's a poet named Michael Derrick Hudson. Does anyone know that name? Cool, because you shouldn't. He sucks, just like Mark Smith. Uh, Michael Derrick Hudson was published in the Best American Poetry Anthology in 2016, but he used a pseudonym. He used the name of a Taiwanese girl he went to high school with, Yi Fen Cho. And he said that he literally used the pen name because he knew it would help him get published. Isn't that messed up? Like, isn't that like you're really gonna change your name to just, just to get public? Like, what are you doing? And I kept thinking about it and I got really mad, but then I realized, oh man, what if Michael Derrick Hudson changed his name to Noctu Tran and then my mother's skin would fit him like a head on a wall or a trophy inside of a glass case or history being told once again by the victors, Michael tries out telling his new story and the words avalanche out of his mouth. Every original syllable now, white, cold, bland, but the bell of every dinner party he attends. Tell me more, his guests squeal, and without hesitation, he talks about how proud he is of us. He raised four brown boys all on the strength of his hands, which are too pale and delicate to have ever known the sweet, bloody labor of an immigrant then he, raped, he drapes himself in the car business, hip dang, started from the ground up. He cuts, himself, he cuts out pieces of my father's tapestry to decorate his narrative. Small detail, easily fixed, white out edit, and erasure. He lets his tongue parade in broken English. Exotic, they tell him. Stupid, they tell us. They take snapshots of our American dream and they frame it and give him a gallery. His picture, 1,000 words. Our picture, one word. Thief, Michael is such an innovator, right? He writes such wonderful stories, practically steals them out of thin air since we are no longer there, no longer taking space, no longer even having names. That was just the wind, he says, at his poetry readings when we gust and we howl and we tornado, but he, him, his body is too weak. He cannot carry us like my mother, so then her skin gives him fever, something starts clawing out from his insides, desperate, gnashing to breathe, to be born. Me and my three brothers start crawling out of his throat. Fistfuls of our father clenched in our knuckles, we smooth the familial cloth, we stuff his arrogant mouth with it, we make Michael choke on our pronunciation. He told our story one too many times, and his colony could not hold us any longer. We broke free, and we took back the names, the recipes, the home, the country, the air. By God, we took back our air, and we filled it with our good, good brown bodies, too hot to touch. We melt his walls, smolder his trophies, burn his house down to the ground, but we leave his name alone. Michael Derrick Hudson, we will leave your name alone for we know history shall decide what to do with you. And I feel like a lot of writers and scholars and young people and people in general will always feel like oh, I need to talk about this thing, and once I do, everybody gets mad about it, of like, oh, yeah, 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 you're really brown, you're really brown, and then I start talking about being brown and Asian, and they're like, whoa, 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 now you're being too Asian, now you're being too ethnic, now you're being too brown, and I'm like, whoa, you're the one who made it all about race in the first place, so now that I'm talking about it, you're getting mad at me? That seems a little hypocritical, but okay, all right, you know what, white critics? I've literally had this argument with many of my critics who say that, oh man, it's not accessible because I put Vietnamese in it or because I put Chinese in it or because I'm telling my story, it's not accessible. Okay, I guess I'm not a human being. I guess I won't write about race. You know what, white critics? Fine. I will stop writing poems about my race if you promise me that the clerk doesn't roll his eyes at my mom's accent or when you promise me that me and my father drive without signal of a stereotype, that's the day I will abandon this slanted path that I walk where I can finally see all around me despite the slit of my eyes, speak without fear of an accent even though you still will hear it. My poems will become cinder and dust when I no longer look too burnt to be on a silver screen. When my tongue is enough to be heard by anybody's ears. 
especially the ones that always perk up with shock, the ones who cannot believe how eloquent I talk, the ones that can't see the rusted chain mail, who can't see the chink in my armor, this won't exist in the better post-racial world, the world that doesn't qualify more my work as just Asian or as pretty good for A or as a, you know he only wins because he's, look, deliver me from my life, my anxiety is a double-edged hatchet ready to bury, like me, one edge wanting to apologize constantly, the other wanting to sharpen off the back of flagpoles holding confederacy, but I am always covered in my own blood, but so are they, and so are these pages, and I am never not tiptoeing on the blade's jawline. I took my first steps here. I'll stop writing this poem when I can afford to be clumsy and not worry about cutting off my own head if I trip. Of course, it's always my fault, though. Never yours, always mine. I shouldn't be nervous, I'm being paranoid. I have affirmative action, model minority, a higher median wage than a white man. I've got so much going for me. Socially acceptable fetish, dress me in silk and I will fit in your sheets or teeth or platter on fine china. Make me wash the plate you eat me on after you crack me open. I spill out exotic fortunes. I am so polite, I leave my aggressions on slips of paper with lucky numbers on the back. I am your lucky day, golden coin, dragon, garden and look this was supposed to be a poem about me unapologizing and yet here I am so fluent and sorry that you don't even question that this is my native language how you always laugh at me for being so Asian and here here's the most punchline thing about me the silence after the joke is being told my willingness to put myself in a boiling pot and never scream and maybe you're right maybe we all do look alike like how a knife only sees meat to be cut to fit inside of a hungrier mouth. So sometimes I get angry, uh, and sometimes I write poems about Pokemon, and sometimes I write poems about my mom or my dad, but mostly I write about poems that mean something to me. I'm trying to take my marginalizations and make them into my narrative. I'm trying to take the things that I know, that I love, that I hate, that I am experiencing every day to try to tell you a story. And I would love to hear your story, even if it's born out of the most mundane of questions, even if it's just about how your day was, because we've all heard love poems before, but I haven't heard your love poem yet. I haven't heard what your love looks like, and I really, really want to know, just like how the entire world wants to know what your story is. So as I deliver this one last poem, uh, I want you to remember that we're all more than just one thing. We can be anything we want, and oftentimes we're more than just one thing. Who here is a scholar? Who here is a sibling? Older sibling? Younger sibling? Who here is an only child? Who here is an artist? Who here is a scientist? Who here is an athlete? Who here is the group mom? Who here is the group dad telling the jokes? Who's your babyest boy? Who's the cute baby? Who's the, I'm baby. <laughs> But notice how a lot of you raise your hands multiple times for multiple things because you yourself have multiple identities inside of you. You yourself have so many worlds inside of you that if you just centralize that one story, you can start telling so many more things. Just like how a poem can have so many different emotions. Just like how a question, a very dumb question, can have multiple answers like, what kind of Asian are you? And I was like, in the year of our Lord, 2019, people are still asking me this question? All right, man, well, let me break it down for you. That is a loaded question. What kind of Asian do you expect me to be? Because anyway, you slice that egg, girl, I'm still pretty much whatever you want to see. I have played many a Far East stereotype. Uh, awkward math genius, cold and calculated kung fu expert, assistant to Dr. Jones, you crazy. It's always just dependent on the circumstance. They want me to drive? How so? I can give them Tokyo Drift, Jeremy Lin, Mario Kart, Tiger Woods, and Blinker Left On for about half a mile. I am the foremost expert on everything Asian. The Meiji era and the ban of the samurai? Done. Confucianism versus Taoism? I'll give it to you with no slant. What's the difference between Asian stereotype one and two? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you anything you want to know about my culture. Let me tell you. In a Mulan-esque soliloquy of me staring in the mirror asking, who 
is that girl that I see? Let me tell you about Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, and how they're related by blood to me, your boy. Let me tell you about being so marginalized, it's to the point of I really can't believe that's Asian. Let me tell you about derogatory terms and origins of words such as chink and gook. Let me tell you about the struggle of Asian parents not knowing the language so we ate clearance food because it was the cheapest. Let me tell you about the job of interpreter. When you're playing with Lego blocks, but your English is already that much better than your guardians, let me tell you about honor and dignity. Let me tell you about a society that projects us as nothing but the secondary role and never the leading man. Let me tell you all the things that you do not want to know. Like a chink comes from the clanking of metal to railroad as the slaves built train tracks for this country to be connected. Like how the zipper head down the street is called that because the way our head split opens when struck with assault weapons or how jeeps ran over and left marks across corpses and someone clever thought that we were only good to unzip. Like how every time you lump an Asian person together into one culture is systematically making us assimilate into an America that we thought was better than our war-torn homes. Every time you confuse me for some other nationality that I might share similar Features to strips away my individuality, and I still feel the shame of being Asian. But also the heat and pious dedication of June 11th, 1963. Yes, I still feel the envy of blonde hair and blue eyes, and yes, I still remember thinking where all the boys who looked like me on TV were. But yes, there are also the broken words my mother and father stage diving off of my tongue, the anger I felt when those kids thought I would get them sick, and I still feel the ash of the, of the incense burn my hands as I prayed for my family, and I still remember thinking my skin was what I was worth, and I still feel the ironwork of my bones go strong with every train of thought that passes by and I still feel pride, I still feel heritage, I still feel Chinese, I still feel Vietnamese, I still feel American and I still feel. Thank you, WSC. Hey, I just yelled at you guys a lot. Let's all take a deep breath on three. Uh, 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 let's all inhale <gasps> and out. <sighs> I couldn't do it on three because I don't know math. <sighs> so y'all want to do a Q&A or something? Yeah? I think we can do a Q&A. Patrick, you want to help me out with that? Yes, I will. Thank you. But before we do that, how about one more big round of applause for Alex? Thank you so much, Alex, for sharing a part of your story and your insights and your energy and your passion. Uh, now is an opportunity for you to share a bit of your story and your insights and your passion with Alex. So in a moment, we're going to start the question and answer session. And if you have a comment or a question that you would like to share with Alex, we have two microphones set up here at the uh, front of the auditorium. And we have Timothy at one microphone, and we have Alid at another one. So if you have a question or a thought you'd like to share with Alex, feel free at this time to stand up and line up behind the microphones. And as you are doing that, um, I like to take every opportunity I can to climb onto this chair because I have a theory that everyone see, who sees a big chair like this wants to sit on it. So I'm going to sit up there. Alex, you're welcome to be anywhere on stage, where, wherever you would like to field questions. Uh, so. All right, y'all, do you want me to sit on the big chair, Dave, or the airplane chairs? Yeah. All in favor of Dave? Oh, I'm all in favor of the big chair? Oh. All in favor of the airplane chair? Looks like I'm going on the big chair. All right. Thanks, I like calling microphones and mics Michaels and Miguels. Like, if there's an open mic, I always call it an open Michael. So uh, whenever I see microphones, I'm like, oh, look, there's Tim and there's Michael. And I have bad jokes, OK? <laughs> but I don't feel bad about them, and that's the important thing. All right, wow. Okay, 
So as you come up and you share your thought, please do introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and where you're from. And so that we can get to as many comments and questions as possible, please do limit your comment to one thought or one question. And thank you, as always, for being respectful of all of the nations that are here uh, with your question or comment. So with that, I think we'll start Timothy. Hi, uh, my name is Meher Suri from the International School of Amsterdam, and I have one question. So, um, other than your heritage and cultural background, what other factors do you believe to have influenced your poetic and literary journey? Who? Um, just for the personal identity things, or just all kind of influences? Well, anything really. Well, it's taken me a really, really long time to say very confidently that I'm half Chinese, half Vietnamese, Asian American, cis, male, queer, 25 years old. But um, all those different identities come into play, uh, not in an intersectional way, because that was born out of a concept for just black queer femmes, but in a more way of like multiplicity, in which I know that my identities can shift up and down because of my male privilege, and I can kind of turn that on and off whenever I want to. So these uh, identities definitely play with uh, how I present my work and how I want to deal with my my privileges. In general though, like my oldest brothers always, you know, influence me. They've turned me on to hip hop. I really love food. Um, I'm a really big comedy fan. I love how comics write. I'm deathly scared of comedians because I think that's such difficult kind of writing. Uh, I used to do speech and debate back in the day, so that's kind of why I know a little bit of the, yeah, 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 I got, see, see this dude's on my side. He, he likes my criterion. <laughs> But um, yeah, I really, uh, a lot of my influences mostly, I think, come from hip hop and then all of my English teachers, honestly. Mr. Gonzalez, who is my speech and debate coach as well, I still text him to this day. Thank you, that was profound. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Nia Katya Borzakova. I'm from Bulgaria, and hi. because I also write poetry, I'm going to have that type of question. Yeah, give me a craft um, question, I love it. So, some, I'm really new to performing it. I had my poetry slam like half a month ago. Ooh. And so, my question for you is, how do you draw out that emotion on stage? Because when I do it, the overwhelming thing I feel is I feel super nervous and I stutter and I often even say, before I start doing it, and I'm super nervous about it. Mm -hmm. And I can't really control my emotions in, in that way that you do, so how do you do it? Well, would you say that before a voter speech? In front of a judge? Like, hey, I'm really nervous? Not really. See, so I learned from speech and debate. I learned how to put on a facade. Uh, I also used to be an actor, so sometimes I will put a distance of myself of like, oh, this is a script. I need to learn who this character is. I can always protect myself treating it as a script. But here's the thing, you're also the screenplay writer, you're also the main actor, you're also the director. So there's different ways in which you can assert your own dominance and assert your own agency in different ways that make you feel comfortable. But I would definitely say above all, it's to um, remember that everybody is on your side and nobody wants, to make, nobody wants to see you do a bad job, unless they're just horrible and horrific, but then that's just a horrible and horrific person. So. Trust yourself. Um, my favorite advice uh, by a writer named Ocean Vong, he says to be scared, but do not be scared of yourself. Good morning. Um, my name is Siddharth, and I'm from the UAE. I love writing and poetry, so I just wanted to ask you, what's the, difficult, what's the most difficult part of your job? Whew, most difficult part of my job. Um, honestly, I would say getting the right words, right? It's really, if I'm gonna write a poem about my life, about being Asian, about being queer, I have to make sure I use the right words because you can't control it once it's out there. It's, uh, there's a great Mark Twain quote, it's the difference between the fire and the firefly. It's the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. So for me, it's always about which right words to use, and that always scares me because I'm always afraid of making a mistake. But the other half of it is that I need to learn and everybody needs to learn how to make mistakes and how to be accountable for those mistakes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask just a quick follow-up? How do you know, Alex, when you have the right words? You have a feeling or you just don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know a lot of the times and I will, I will lean on my friends, my family, my community, the people that I love and who love me and trust me. We always have a romantic notion of the artist trapped in the basement writing the greatest piece of art, but we know the best ideas come at like 3 a.m., you're sleep deprived, your friend says something dumb and you go, wait a minute, that might be a real idea and you and all your friends have this really, really great 3 a.m. conversation. You can never do things alone. So if you're scared, uh, lean on a friend. I'm sure they'll help. Hey, I'm Hi. Meredith. I'm from the US. I'm from the great state of Texas, y'all. And Ooh, a lot of Texans. My uh, basic question is I am also a writer. And I'm wondering, like, I don't necessarily want to do this like exclusively for a living because I plan to be a professor on the side. But I do still want to like, you know, this is my, I still want this to be a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what's the best advice you've ever received as a writer? Who, best advice I ever received as a writer? Hmm. I think, honestly, it is going to be to make sure you are writing for yourself. Um, I remember someone was always telling me, who am I writing for? And I was like, oh, well, you know, if, if it's going to be this audience and I want to write something funny, and then I was like, oh, but if, you know, if I'm performing for my parents, I'm probably going to do these poems. And then uh, my, this was actually Mr. Gonzalez, my speech and debate coach. And he said, but you're writing for other people. How is that going to be good? You need to tell your story. So it was always about just telling my story, and that becomes a very difficult thing because then I have to look inwardly and actually look at myself and look at all my mistakes and all the things that I've messed up on and actually be accountable for them and try to process through. So that would be my best advice, but it's also the hardest advice, and I can barely follow it to this day, but I try. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sneha. I'm so sorry. I'm kind of, my throat is not very good right now. Don't worry, my throat um, isn't great either. <laughs> I'm Indian and I live in Singapore. So my first question, my, my question has two parts. Um, did you imagine that poetry would ever take you this far? And what advice do you have to other Asians who may live in countries that they're not originally from? Yeah, uh, no, uh, I was very surprised. Uh, once again, I was gonna be a rapper. <laughs> uh, I like fell into poetry very accidentally. I was 17, I wanted to practice one of my songs, uh, a cappella on the open mic, but that open mic happened to be the Portland Poetry Slam. And I did a lot of speech and debate and theater at the time. So when I saw a slam poem, which basically looked like a three minute monologue that I could write and perform directly to an audience and then get judged, I was like, I know how to do this. Um, and then I kept being part of the community and I kept being part of them and they gave me a lot of opportunities to succeed and ever since then I've learned that I am the most lucky when I am the most prepared. <laughs> so that idea of I wasn't ready for these opportunities but I saw them coming and I knew that I had to open the door and let opportunity at least sleep on the couch before I could make up the guest bedroom. So, uh, that, so as far as like my story goes, very, very surprised but um, I had good people looking after me saying that like I should do it. And I'm sure everybody kind of has a good crew and if you don't, you can find those people probably at WSC. And my advice for anybody who feels kind of marginalized, specifically Asians who don't feel like they belong, um, my mom and dad never feel like they belong, and yet they definitely belong in Portland, and they know exactly who they are. So this idea of anchoring yourself to certain ideas, anchoring yourself to certain monuments, or even food, memories, people of your kind, just creating a community, I think would be the best way to really, really anchor and solidify yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm Peter. I'm from the International School of Amsterdam. I'm part Dutch and part Indonesian. And my question concerns actually another really simple question that mm -hmm. I get asked a lot and I think you can really resonate with. And this really simple question is the question, where do you come from? Now, as I've lived the vast majority of my life outside of Indonesia, in the Netherlands, I find this a really hard question to answer, and I usually answer with the Netherlands, and this sense of guilt that I feel only recognizing one half of my origin, mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I simply don't know how to, under, how to answer this question, and I thought maybe you might have the answer. Nope, <laughs> but that is a really good question that I constantly ask myself every day. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you really from? 
and sometimes I will answer Portland, Oregon. Sometimes I'll be like, my mom's womb. <laughs> sometimes I will be like, I'm from a place of guilt. I'm from a place of victory. I'm from me. So for on my, and my real answer is like context. It depends on who's asking me and what kind of intention they have. If I can tell it's another Asian person asking where I'm from because they're trying to figure out what language to use, I will immediately answer. If it's a white dude who's bothering me at work and he wants to talk about Thai iced tea, nah, nah, I'm not going to give him my time of day. So I think it's, it's about your own comfortability. And you recognizing this guilt is really powerful because I have this level of guilt as well, and I think a lot of people do. But the fact that you're recognizing it and you're wondering what to do about it and the fact that you want to challenge it is the work that you should be doing. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hi, I'm Richard. I'm from Cambodia. I live in Cambodia. And I also am uh, sort of a poet. And I have a question because sometimes when I sit down to create, I feel fear and afraid of the things that I make because mm -hmm. I just don't know how to conquer the emptiness of a blank page. I yep. would ask you to tell us, for everyone's sake, how do you start? How do I start? Usually on Twitter. <laughs> um, there's this, I have a very, very deep fear as well as, oh man, this first draft has to be perfect. Or like, I can't make up, I can't make mistakes, I can't mess up. So I've kind of gotten over this hump by literally just posting whatever I want on Twitter without thinking about grammar issues, without typos, just really posting things for me and creating content just for myself. And this will help you in a way of remembering that there's going to be lots of stages and a lot of steps to this. Uh, but my ultimate guide is put a timer on for two minutes, and your challenge is to write as much as you can in those two minutes, even if it's, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, Alex told me to do this, I'm just thinking about things, I'm just doing a stream of conscious, because your body needs to be connected with your mind. So once you get into the process of writing, it often finds time easier for you to actually think about what you want to write about, and you're already writing. And then you expand it to three minutes four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes of just straight writing, and then you will have so much clay to create sculptures out of. Thank you. Thank you. These are great questions, and I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, we only have time for two more comments. But the good news is that Alex is going to be with us throughout the round. So I know he's very interested in connecting with you, so please do feel free to come up and say hello, and. Uh, Share your thought or question at that point. Um, hi, um, hi, I'm Regina Balagot from the UAE delegation. And I'm also a poet, so I just want to ask, um, when did you know that you were going to take poetry seriously, and how did your parents react to it? Um, I wanted to take it seriously. Um, after my, uh, after my first slam that I won, uh, I was qualified to be on the national team, and it was my first trip outside of Portland, Oregon to the big city of Boston. And it was my first real trip, and poetry allowed me to travel, so I thought, this is an opportunity for me that I need to take. And I met so many great people, so many great artists that I really wanted to be part of that community. Uh, telling my parents was difficult because when I was 19 and trying to tell them, I didn't have the vocabulary, but now that I understand they just want to make sure that I'm safe and they want to make sure that I'm responsibly thinking about things, it's easier because I'm more of an adult to be like, oh, I get what you're saying, Dad. I'll work at the shop like three days a week, but like I'm going to go on this trip because I'm going to do poems. And now I'm being honest about what I really want instead of like trying to skirt around the truth. So before, when I was just trying to pass it off as nothing, it didn't really work, but now that I'm being honest with my parents and saying, hey, this is actually what I want to do, they're listening to me because they can actually see the conviction and the dedication in my eyes for once. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Iman, and I come from Kenya. So I'm kind of a poet, but I wanted to ask, how do you express yourself when you get righteous block? Yes, I would argue that everybody is a poet. I have a poem about my mom performing poetry, but really it's like, you know, she cooks me breakfast before she leaves to work, and then I wake up and I have breakfast. Oh, that's a love poem right there in my head. So uh, everybody's a poet. Writer's block, though, uh, it sucks, but there is ways to destroy it, because if you're not writing, you should be reading. And if you're not reading, you should be editing. And if you're not editing, you should be writing. Which, in my head, as far as all artists go, there will always kind of be that block. So if you're not creating, 
you should be consuming and you should be thinking about the books that you love and analyzing them about like, wow, how did the Phantom Toll Booth do this? Or like when you're listening to music, you're like, damn, J. Cole's flow is really good. Let me study dactyls and rhymes for a really quick second. And as you are consuming, then you start trying to emulate. Then you start trying to write and figure out what they're doing and figure out in your voice. And then you start editing. And then once you edit it, then you're like, oh man, I need to read some more to find out some more. And you go back to reading, writing, editing. So that would be my advice, is that if you're looking one way, look the other way. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for some fantastically insightful questions. Um, give yourselves a round of applause. And then join me in giving one final huge round of applause to our keynote speaker, Alex Dang. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Y'all are very nice. Thank you. In a moment, we are going to transition to a very important event known as lunch. Man, how'd y'all know? Smart. They're smart. It is so important that we have designed an efficient way to get each and every one of you to lunch. And Dylan and Chauncey have joined us on stage to walk you through that process. This is because lunch dismissal will take a long time and we are jealous of your chairs, so we are creating our own. So, scholars. Hello. Long time no see. This is known as stalling. Why are we stalling? I don't actually know. Lunch is ready. Stall is also the name of one of the sitting areas. Ah, indeed. Yes, scholars, a few quick notes. In a moment, you will eat lunch. <laughs> 